Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. Is Trump doing a 180 to please his political foes? It sure looks like it. Indeed, the mainstream media is now singing his praises. One has to ask, has the deep state and the neocons tamed Donald Trump? Cross-talking Trump's foreign policy. I'm joined by my guest Joaquin Fleurs in Belgrade. He is a political strategist and journalist. And here in Moscow, we have Dmitry Babich. He's a political analyst with Sputnik International. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Joaquin, let me go to you first here. I said in my introduction here, uh, is Trump doing, asking a question, I don't think it's actually rhetorical, is Donald Trump doing a 180 uh, in foreign policy, considering what he said on the campaign trail, what he said during his his inauguration and what he's been saying up until, well, a few days ago. Go ahead, Joaquin. You know, he may be doing a 180. I think it's difficult to tell. Uh, there are a lot of intelligent people who disagree, and I try to pay attention to them. On the one hand, of course, we know that in general, uh, democratically elected leaders in the United States, uh, along with uh, those doing the electing, the people, often don't have much say in American foreign policy. Uh, domestic policy is another issue, of course, but foreign policy always seems to be tied to vested interests that are very well connected to uh, both the military industrial complex and, of course, the financial sector. And their interest in Syria are so very strong that I think it's very difficult for any le leader, even the president of the United States, yep. to go against this. Now, was this some sort of plan that, that Trump had, or did he intend to do or intend to go against his campaign pr promises? I think that's the other question. Yeah. Dima, it's very interesting. Is, mm -hmm. it's, you know, over the last few days, we have a new narrative. Mm -hmm. OK, we have um, Trump is finally president. Heard that on CNN. That's kind of interesting. It <laughs> says a lot right there. Um, the, his political foes have come together, backing him on this illegal strike against a sovereign country. Uh, there was no investigation into this uh, 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 um, chemical weapons incident here. Um, is this the end of Russiagate? Because one would get that impression. One narrative has replaced another because Donald Trump is doing, quote unquote, the right thing. Yes. Well, I like the headline on CNBC about it. Uh, the headline said, uh, Trump has just yanked the Russia card out of the Democrats' hands. There is a complete uh, flip over of the narrative, of the script about Trump and Russians. For the last eight months, we have been hearing that Trump is a Russian agent, you know, he's going to play into the hands of Russians. Suddenly, just one bombing is enough to change the whole narrative. So I think the so-called liberals have exposed themselves, and, and, and not only in the United States. Mrs. Merkel and Francois Hollande, you know, the president of France, who have been calling Trump a threat, threat to, European to European security for several months, suddenly they side with him hours after, after the bombing, without even finding out how many people were killed, uh, whether the chemical stockpiles were hit, uh, whether it was dangerous or not. They sided with him immediately, and in this way they exposed themselves. Actually, okay. they want war, and they were concerned about Trump's victory, not because Trump is unpredictable, but because Trump could be peaceful. Now he is a war president, and they feel themselves well, much relieved. Well, Joaquin, I'll go back to you in Belgrade. He's just as unpredictable as he always has been. I think that's the only consistency through all of this. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely holding a lot of cards, and I think that he had to play this. But I want to say first that I, I uh, don't really like the fact that we live in a world where we can talk about strategy and talk about you know, what he's doing and what he's not doing. Human lives have been lost. A sovereign country has been attacked okay. illegally. And whether or not this works out for or against Trump or whether or not this is something that Trump needed in the name of peace or in the name of war, human lives have been lost. And I think, first and foremost, that has to be condemned. And I think you were right to do that. But moving forward, of course, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, I think it's really to be seen here. The problem, of course, is that we have, like we said, uh, a ruling class in the United States that is bent on war. And it is true that Trump really ran against them. Yep. Uh, he may have agreed with them on certain domestic issues, but when it comes to foreign policy, he was completely against this. And I think he had no reason to lie about that. So now we're looking at, you know, his, his wrist being twisted in this direction. Yep. The real question is, 
did he do something strategic here to placate them sure. and to get back on track, which is, which is the policy that he's trying to put into place. Okay, and I want to uh, uh, have a take a look at a clip here by Brian Williams at MSNBC. And the reason why I want uh, um, uh, you gentlemen to see it and our viewers is because this is the type of media environment that is in the United States right now that simply glorifies war and violence. Let's take a look. Go into greater detail. We see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two U.S. Navy vessels in the eastern Mediterranean. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. Um, and they are beautiful pictures of, uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield. Dima, that this leaves me speechless. I have to say that you know you have a, a, a liberal media mm -hmm. in the United States that had been had, well. I can't get any more liberal <laughs> than that. You know, demonizing Donald Trump, and there's reasons to do, uh, criticize Donald Trump on many different issues. I think that's fair to say. But now you have this chorus effect here. It's 2003 all over again. It's uh, the Tolkien Gulf Resolution 2.0 now. Yeah, I mean, there's no introspection, no investigation, very quick to decide who's to blame. And, um, and the worst thing about all of this, not just the loss of lives, is what's going to happen next? Because over the, in this entire century of American foreign policy in the Middle East, it has never worked out once. Why do they think it's going to work again, Dima? You're absolutely right. And uh, I like the way Max Blumenthal uh, put it on RT's opinion page. He wrote that we saw a chorus of idiot liberals, I would call them idlibs, celebrating the lack of congressional oversight on the Trump's administration move, which uh, was probably illegal. So, uh, I mean, the irony of the situation is that liberals, yes. the people who are supposed to be against war, they, they had a sigh of relief when the war was actually started. And I absolutely agree with Joaquin that it's not a laughing matter, it's a terrible tragedy. But just look at all the inconsistencies. I mean, the, 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 how the, the incident uh, uh, in uh, Han Shai Hoon was uh, played by the liberal media. It was assertion, you know, Assad did it. It was guilt by association. Similar attacks happened before. So and something uh, must be, be done. done. And something must be done. You know, that was a phrase actually from Rex Tillerson. A lot of hopes were connected with him, but he said that uh, uh, um, Iran bears moral responsibility for it. Russia bears more moral responsibility. And something should happen. Well, something should happen. That's a yeah, talk they, from a schoolboy. You, school you, you, know, you, you know, Joaquin, it's, you know, the, and, and I want to talk about this later in the program here, but, you know, that is a foreign policy of only hammers that can only see nails in the world. And that's what we've gotten in this century with American foreign policy. We can go all the way back to Southeast Asia as well. Go ahead and we'll jump in, Joaquin. Yeah, you know, what I think here is that when I, when I listened to Brian Williams saying what he said, the first thing that came to mind was that's a war criminal talking. That's a war criminal talking. It's not just those giving orders. It is the media. Yes. And this is the Geneva Convention, right? This is the media. When they promote war, when they go to bat, when they cheerlead for war, that is a war crime, especially when that war is an illegal war, and that, and that is a crime against humanity. And I, and I am waiting for that day. I am working for that day when people like Brian Williams will be on trial and be hung for those words. I'm sorry, but that, that is the most disgusting thing I have seen or heard on TV in a good number of years. To, to call the bombing of innocent people beautiful is, I, I mean, I, 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 I'm speechless as well. Yeah, yeah. I, this is just I mean, beyond and, the pale. And, and, and Joaquin, they call us propagandists, okay? Well, That's the irony think, also on top of it, okay? I think Joaquin, Go ahead, Dima. Yeah, Joaquin uh, uh, touched a very important issue of responsibility. I mean, even if we take for a minute the narrative of the mainstream media about uh, this chemical attack being done by the Syrian government, why was there no investigation of the previous chemical attack in 2013 right. when many more people died? Why did they lose interest? Because as soon as they... it didn't come to the results yeah. that they wanted, and that's exactly. why it disappeared. Well, okay. well, well we know for, 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 for sure that it's a fact that Iraq used chemical weapons against Iranians in the 80s. Was there any investigation when Americans uh, were in control of Iraq? No one paid any attention. They just wanted to pick that person 
you know, close to Saddam Hussein, chemical Ali. They put all the blame on him and they never investigated anymore. Colin Powell, who lied about anthrax, holding that flask in his hand, he told us that this is going to be with me until the end of my life. Well, legally speaking, I agree with Joaquin, it should be with him until the end of his life in jail, you know, because that was a terrible war that killed hundreds of thousands of people. He lied. And he is still there with his pension, a respected American retired politician. You know, Joaquin, I, I, was, I was watching the, the uh, uh, statements coming out of the United Nations uh, and comparing the Russian envoy to the American envoy. I think there was a big difference there, okay? How would you describe that with Nikki Haley standing up with her pictures? Go ahead. You know, uh, I, I think the old adage is true. Uh, you can't buy class. And Ooh, every yeah. single American that's been sent to the UN in living memory has really had no class. And to see Haley standing there with these pictures, yeah, it reminded me a lot like uh, Colin Powell standing there with his fake pictures of like a drawing of a, of a truck that, you know, had some mobile laboratory in it. That was never confirmed, never proven. A million lives later, and what do we have? Another destroyed country. Now we have Syria. It's been in the crosshairs the last five, six years. And who's doing anything about it? Very few people are, but those who are are fighting tooth and nail to make sure that what happened to Syria uh, will not be the same as what happened to Iraq, will not be the same as what happened to Yugoslavia and so forth. Dima, go ahead, real quick well, before the break. Well, just, uh, just recently we had U.S. aviation inadvertently killing 200 people near Mosul. And there was a belated investigation. By, they, they investigated themselves, themselves if I'm correct. You know, there were judges in their own matter. And finally they decided that the responsibility was with their enemies, not with them. And now, without even investigating, with, without having the U.N. come to the spot and check that footage, they immediately say right. that Assad gassed his own let, people. Let me know? jump in here, gentlemen. We're going to go to a short break and after. Our short break will continue on Trump's 180. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing Trump's 180. Okay, let me go back to Joaquin in, in Belgrade. Um, We've all noticed that uh, Donald Trump uh, can be um, uh, react very quickly. He can af uh, act, uh, act off the cuff. Okay, he's um, uh, launched an attack against a sovereign country uh, illegally under international law. If you look at the people that surround him in the military and in some in the intelligence community, which I think is very interesting and very telling, that we haven't heard too many people in the intelligence community, their assessment of the situation, we've only heard from the military. Um, you know, we know people around him in, in the military before he was elected were very skeptical of Barack Obama's uh, approach to Syria. Now they seem to be on board for the, the pro-war uh, pro, pro party here. What is their plan? Or are they just going to play it by uh, ad hoc, as they always do? And I think all of us know and our viewers know that never works out right. Go ahead. Well, I think that the minute that uh, Donald Trump made that order, we saw some stocks rise in some of these companies uh, associated with armaments. So there's, there's always that factor. You can never forget that the United States has a privatized system of weapons production. And so uh, this is the definition of war profiteering. Uh, so, of course, they'd prefer to go through and, and, use, uh, and use weapons so that they can fill orders for new ones. So that's always going to be part of it. Now, uh, the fact that Trump has made this 180, uh, I think that this goes against what most people voted him in for. But his, as you said, those in the military surrounding him uh, were happy to see this. I don't think we're going to hear much from the intelligence community at this point because uh, they aren't very happy yep. that he's been able to at least divide some of his opponents. Um, and, and again, I don't like speaking about uh, war crimes in terms of Machiavellian calculations and so forth, but that is the world that we live in. I do think that Trump's hand was forced here, but I think that he tried to play it as well as possible. Um, I'm not a pro-Trump fan. I'm not a Trump supporter by any stretch. But what I will say is that um, if he doesn't have an interest in war, uh, what he did would be the closest rational thing that he could do, given the fact that the odds in Congress are stacked up against him. We have rumors of attempts that they may try to impeach him. Of course, we must imagine that the CIA has made it very clear in no uncertain terms that if they could you know, do a Kennedy on him if they wanted to. And that's the reality of American political life. 
have. Uh, but as Trump said, who, when he was running for president, that when, if Obama were to move against Syria, that he would own Syria, that would, he would own that problem. Exactly. And now, now in this moment, now in this moment, Trump owns Syria. And the yep. question is, what will Trump do with it? And, and how will the international community respond to this aggression? Well, Dima, the obvious thing is, and, and, and it's the more cooler minds, rational, sober minds, that worry about a, a conflict, direct conflict between Russia and the United States over the skies of Syria, on the soil of Syria mm -hmm. here. Um, that's not what Russia wants. But that's the only way, if they're going to have forced regime change, that's what's going to happen. And that's a political calculus that I think should terrify the entire world. Well, I, I, let's hope for the best. Uh, and uh, actually, if you look at this attack, it was absurd. Because what did they destroy? A canteen? You know, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry even said that 36 out of 59 missiles simply missed their targets and hit uh, the desert. That'll show them. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, I agree with Joaquin, uh, and I don't think it, it was even a secret that the liberal, uh, so-called liberal warmongers wanted to impeach Trump. I mean, they, they don't hide it. There were headlines in the Washington Post and the New York Times. How do we impeach Trump? You know, how do we uh, yeah, stop him the, from but, doing you know, his policy? My theory is this, is that by ordering that attack, without an investigation, with the intelligence community going dark on everyone, at mm -hmm. least uh, at this moment in time here, is that they want it to be Trump's war. Well, and yes. it's a war that is going to be very, very difficult to win. Because, Absolutely. you know, you have outside forces. We have the government in Tehran that has made it very clear that there will be no forced regime ch uh, change in, in Damascus. Syria, yes. Sure, the, the Iranians may have uh, trainers and, uh, and uh, specialists there, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the Revolutionary Guard is right yeah. on the border there. Exactly. And they've made well, it very clear. Russia also, the Russian foreign policy is a lot more um, subtle. Robust, it's yeah. really interesting how everything is flip-flopped, okay? Absolutely. But, uh, and it, they have made it very clear that they have their red lines, too. Well, okay? summarizing what you say, I would say that Trump uh, made some uh, short short-term gains, uh, and uh, SNBC said it very nicely. They said that uh, the, the strike put Trump's team into a more traditional and accepted role for a presidential administration in the United States. Well, that's terrible, but it's well, that true. that is nonsense. It's absolutely <laughs> it's absurd. It. Well, in, in the United States, until you well, bomb someone, well, you that, are not really a president. That's right, Joaquin. Right? As long as you do the illegal, <laughs> start illegal wars, start killing you people, we're having no uh, international mandate, you're acting like a normal American president. That's exactly what is going on in the world right now? Go but, ahead. But, uh, just, let me let, let okay. Joaquin jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, look, it's... It's, 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 it's a truthful statement, and that is the problem. What is going on in the world today? Um, since the destruction of the Soviet Union, the United States entered into a unipolar model which, in which it sought to dominate the entire planet Earth. I mean, this is, these are the dreams of madmen. This is the stuff that, that genocides are made from, this, this, this unchained ambition uh, fueled by fiery lust for power. I mean, this is what we're talking about here. This is, this is the real stuff, all right? Now, what are we going to do about it? Look, in that time, other countries have, their economies have grown, their militaries have gotten stronger. We're looking at China, India, yeah. Russia, right. and so forth. These are not countries that can be pushed around. Now we have Russia has involved itself in, in the Syrian conflict at the invitation of the Syrian government and the Syrian people who elected them. And I think this is what's a critical difference now and today, that the United States can't get what it wants. I think that Trump recognizes this, and I think that he is probably the, the more sane voice surrounded by madmen. And I would also venture to say that the fact that Trump used the hotline to contact the Russians and let them know what they were up. planning to do, we would only imagine, we would only imagine, I mean, I think we'd be right to imagine that the Russians then contacted the Syrians and we would explain why there's only, you know, a small handful of casualties um, given, given how, many, how many missiles were launched. But Joaquin, and but, I would but, also, Joaquin, and but that's not read, going to yes. happen again. That's not going to happen again. Okay, that was maybe the last that's call right. here, and that's what's really dangerous here. Dima, what I, I've said from the very beginning, since those those um, uh, um, uh, attacks uh, uh, occurred, is that this is not about really Syria um, directly. Directly, it's about Iran in Russia. And this is and a grand <laughs> gambit. Absolutely. Which is really, I, I, it, it just, it, 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 it's outrageous to believe that they're, based on 
um, Afghanistan, based on Iraq, based on Somalia, based on uh, Yemen, based on Libya, that they think they finally found the formula to find success in the Middle East. This really um, well, beggars I mean, belief. Go ahead. Uh, I think you cannot explain uh, the whole policy of the United States in the Middle East only by private interest, even though I agree with Joaquin that some arms manufacturers may get money. We can throw in Israel as a very but important in general, element. the result was the increased terrorist threat in the United States, increased terrorist threat in Europe. They lose a lot more than they gain as nations, you know, the Western nations that, that try to influence the situation in the Middle East. So I think it's an ideology that is to blame. And, and when you ask me do they have a plan? No. Did communists have a plan for the world revolution? They had one, but it was so unrealistic that uh, whenever they tried to apply it, it went terribly wrong, but they tried it again and again. The same story here. They had a plan, which was that Assad should be replaced by their proxies. It couldn't work. Possibly it couldn't work, because the Islamists it were stronger. Uh, Iraq but they was still about, pushed you know, the, with that. the democracy would blossom yes. in the Middle yes. East, okay? And, you think and, they still believe that? And, and in general, you know, in Russia, where we have a very strong liberal press, anti-Putin press, you know, there was jubilation in the beginning because they said, oh, you supported Trump, now look what you, what you are getting. Well, uh, Hillary Clinton, hours before yeah. the attack, said the following, I really believe we should take out his airfields, his Assad's airfields, and prevent him from bombing his own people. Well, so uh, Trump acted exactly as Hillary Clinton would have acted in his place. So basically, what we have is a very sad story. Whatever the she voters won. say... She won! <laughs> whatever the voters say is going to be the same war, because of ideology, not because of personality. You know, Joaquin, the, what he... What it is, what's even more absurd in all of this here is that, that it is the uh, Syrian Arab army, it is with Russia's help, it is with the help of Iran, it is with the help of Hezbollah. They are all collectively carrying the water in fighting terrorism, fighting jihadists, uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the, all the rest of that outfit there. And America can't decide who to fight. Again, this shows the, the how it's all short-circuited here. Um, Donald Trump said he wanted to fight ISIS. He even said maybe they could fight it with Russia. And two and, days later, and two days he later, bombed us. No, I, what, a week ago it was, you know, well, Assad can I, stay. I mean, as if the United States has the right to say who can stay where. I mean, but he this said is it. he it's said so convoluted. Go ahead, thing. Joaquin. Yeah, well, of course they're sending mixed messages, but I don't think that they themselves are confused. Um, they really just, the problem is that they can't really uh, show their, so they really can't show their hand. They really can't talk about what they want to see happen. They don't want to see uh, a, a new government in Damascus. They don't want to see some transition of power. They want to see a failed state. They want to see a yeah. permanent war zone that's going to draw in other countries, specifically Iran, into a broader and broader war, which will, which will mean the end of all stability, progress, development, and peace in that region. It has nothing to do with just swapping one government for another. I think that if it was provable or demonstrable that what the United States wanted to do was simply to swap one government for another government, they, they probably could have built some traction around that. They probably could have even convinced the Iranians and even maybe the Russians that something like this would be acceptable. But the fact that it is clear that the destruction of this country, of Syria, has been the goal that is what that has been so okay. obvious and that okay, has been Joaquin, so clear uh, to every strategist uh, and every we, consultant yes we got 15 seconds left tell me about are we are, is europe should expect another wave of uh, 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 refugees, refugees? I don't think we're going to see another wave of refugees, but we, what we will see is probably some more terrorist attacks in Europe or the United States, which the media will okay. then spin on that, on to that make very a, tragic a, a, note, a, a, yes, gentlemen, a we've war. run out of time. Many thanks to my guests here in Moscow and in Belgrade, and thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, Crosstalk Rules.